didn't really worry about diseases in cotton a whole lot. Uh, we've had issues with reniform nematode, as was mentioned earlier, cotton root knot uh, from time to time, but uh, uh, foliar diseases really haven't been an issue in cotton. And let's see, well, yeah, it did work. There you go. Just hit the wrong button. We do have, have had issues in seedling cotton and younger cotton in some areas, particularly in, the, uh, in Mississippi and Arkansas with angular or bacterial leaf spot in cotton. Weather conditions we're having right now are very conducive to this disease. It likes a lot of wet weather uh, early in the season, more of a problem where cotton is cropped behind cotton. Uh, for us, it's mainly you see these angular leaf spots on the cotyledons and, and, uh, and uh, early leaves that probably, particularly in dryland cotton, as we go through the summer, it's going to fade out because we just don't have the sustained moisture in order to maintain uh, disease development. But it, in Mississippi, it does cause a bull rot get along the Mississippi River. They do have some bull rot issues with, uh, with this disease. It's seed transmitted. And so there are some issues over there with seed fields. Now, if the seed's coming out of Cal uh, uh, Arizona, Central Valley of California maybe, where it's low humidity, you will not see this disease at all. Uh, but they do have some problems in Mississippi mainly on DPL 0912 and phytogen 367 in recent years. So if you have those varieties out there, you might want to keep an eye on them. There aren't any controls for it once it shows up. So that's, that's the problem with these types of bacterial diseases. But we, it has been shown that several varieties, in, including 375, uh, DPL 920, 1133, and Stoneville 5288 are, uh, are resistant to the disease. So we can avoid it to some degree if there are fields that have had a history of having problems with this disease, probably need to plant one of these varieties. Another seedling disease is Ascochyta blight. Uh, you get, again, small leaf spots. Uh, on the cotyledons and younger leaves. The difference between this one and the bacterial disease is that these spots look dry, whereas the one with the bacterial leaf spot or angular leaf spot, you definitely have a wet looking tissue surrounding the lesion itself. That's the, that's the main difference. Uh, the bacteria produce enzymes that break down the uh, cell walls, and that's why you get the what we call water soaking look uh, to the lesions. And that's not what you get with this one. These spots are dry. Now, you know, with certain herbicides, you're going to get this type of leaf spotting anyway, so it's kind of hard to tell the difference between the two. Uh, one thing about herbicide damage or spray damage is that it shows up virtually overnight. In other words, you spray the stuff a day or two before you go out there, you can see the spots pretty uniformly across all the foliage on the plant. Whereas these will tend to be, these types of leaf spotting will tend to develop more prominently on the, on the older uh, leaves or the cotton leaves if you have some true leaves there already. So it's kind of the difference between phytotoxicity and and some of these early season diseases. Uh, I don't know, I was out in some cotton at Headland last week and they sprayed a few days before with some type of burn down. It may have put Valor out there, I guess, to kill some of the peanuts that were coming up in the cotton. Well, I mean, the Valor did a really nice job on the, on the cotton too. It, it burned it up pretty well. Now, the changes come in in mid and late season diseases. Now, there are, as probably all of you are aware, there are some potash related leaf spot diseases in cotton. If you're on sandy land where potash tends to leach, you can run into problems with these leaf spots. And uh, 
they're caused by the fungi alternaria. There's a cercosporin stemphilum. This stemphilum is the one I see more often around here in central and south Alabama. I've seen some cercospora problems as well. Really haven't run into the alternaria too much. And you tend to get leaf spotting develop particularly in the top but also in the middle canopy all at the same time. The spots usually have a purple margin, eventually get a tan center to them. They're not too big. They may be maybe a sixteenth, no more than an eighth of an inch in diameter. Uh, the problems tend to be associate or develop late in the season usually on rain-fed, drought-stressed cotton on sandy land because potash availability, even if it's there, is interrupted by the dry soil conditions. And under a heavy fruit load, the, the leaves will start to spot up, they'll start to dry out, and will fall off the plant. And I think we do have some issues right now, maybe not up here, but more on, again, on a sandy type soils where our potash fertility recommendations have not kept up with the development or advances in the high yield varieties that we have. In other words, we have recommendations that are appropriate for varieties we grew 20 years ago that could make two bales. They don't, they're just not up to date for a four bale potential yield uh, type of variety. And so that may be where some of these problems are coming in. But you see the plants start to lose leaves in the tops. The leaves will go off color. And then a lot of the canopy falls to the ground. Uh, and if it occur, occurs, again, when the cotton is, the bowls are open, it's probably not that much of a problem. But if it occurs in the middle of the summer, uh, that's another matter. And in one of the handouts on the leaf spot, it does review some of the trials that have been done, some of the results showing how the value of supplemental potash applications are either early in the season or mid-season in suppressing the problem. Yeah. Many years ago, like in the 50s, uh, we had leaves to have different uh, diseases. You call them with these long names. We used to call it rust. Have you ever heard of rust? There actually is a rust in cotton. And uh, it's a true rust, just like the ones that you see on small grains and soy, uh, uh, well, soybeans and on corn. But it occurs primarily in the southwest. We don't have the true rust on cotton here. Uh, but it is an issue in other areas of the United States. And I've never, I've never seen it. Uh, but it, you know, if that shows up, then it, that's another game changer. We'd My had. question was, uh, could we have confused uh, what you're calling with these scientific names? Uh, could we have been calling that same thing, rust? Yeah, probably. Wouldn't be surprised. I've seen the potash deficiency called rust years ago. And also, farmers called spider mite rust at times years ago. Yeah, it... it You know, the, the reason why we come up with this stuff is we start looking for it too, you know. And we start, and it, it may be better diagnostics on our part, so we start being able to more specifically identify some of the problems that might have gone on. But this probably is something you've seen in the past, because I'm sure you get on a lighter soil type, you're going to run into potash deficiencies from time to time, and that's how it shows up. Now, I already mentioned about the potash requirements. If you run into a problem where the cotton is starting to shed its leaves, you don't really know why it's going on, you can take a, a foliar sample uh, and send it to the diagnostic lab to see whether or not it's an, it's an infectious disease or not. But also, if you send material to a soil lab, uh, you can look, one, to a foliar analysis and then send a soil sample along with that foliage sample if you want a foliar analysis. Whether it's the Auburn's lab or you send it to a, an outside laboratory, 
Uh, usually it's better to have both than one or the other because it's easier for us to, to maybe come to a decision as to what the problem might be. One of the things, and I'm new to, to doing research on cotton, uh, one of the things that I ran into in Central and South Alabama and a lot of my field trials last year was a potash deficiency. And I was growing phytogen 499 and DPL 1050. And I lost half of my trials, just had to give up on them because of potash problems. So what we're doing this year, and which is number three on the list is, I've specified to the substation superintendents that they put out an additional 60 units of potash at planting and then we're coming out as a side dress with another 30 to 60 pounds or units per acre to avoid any issues with potash deficiency on some of these high yielding varieties. One of the things that's been shown in field trials is that quadris, headline, and twin line, which are labeled for each of those leaf spots, these type of leaf spots on cotton, they don't work. They're not going to help with these types of uh, diseases because they are induced by the potash deficiency. So you got to go after the potash problem not, and not address it with a fungicide. And usually once the leaves are coming off, those over the top potash applications ain't going to help. Now they might help if they're made on a regular, at regular intervals beginning early in the season. I don't know whether Charlie's, Charlie, Charlie's gone. He, he might have done some work with some of these supplemental potash over the top products. Uh, and they might help. But once the symptoms start showing up, you can't put enough potash out there to correct it. Now the disease that's kind of changing the situation in south and central Alabama is target spot. Now this, the fungus that causes this disease is an aggressive pathogen on cotton. And in some of the trials, variety trials and field trials and farms that in South Alabama, we've seen upwards of 75 to 80 percent premature defoliation from target spot. Now one of the questions we have is that we haven't answered very well is how much yield loss it might be causing. Now, the weather we have right now is perfect for the early onset of target spot in cotton, frequent showers. So, and if it continues to rain over the course of the summer, you may see this disease in this area. You're likely to see it. Now, whether it's having an impact on yield or not, that's an open question. And there are trials that have been established here on the substation to try and address whether the question as to whether or not our target spot is going to be a problem for the folks here in this room. Now we know it is further south, but it may or may not be here, uh, particularly depending on the variety that, that you might be growing. But it certainly is going to be a disease that needs to be watched in irrigated cotton. And that's where we're having the most problems with it further south. It's a real easy disease to diagnose. It's the, the leaf spots are much different from those of those potash related diseases that I mentioned earlier. The spots are usually a quarter to a half an inch in diameter and I've seen them up to an inch in diameter. They have a definite target spot or concentric ring pattern to them. The other ones don't. So you have bands of light and dark areas. Under really wet conditions, when it's really hot, you can actually see the leaf starts to blight in the areas of the leaf spot. Now that's not real common, but you may see that. This disease is a classic leaf spot in that it starts out at the bottom of the plant and moves up and out towards the shoot tips. Just like any of the leaf spots we run into in soybeans, the same ones, same pattern you see in corn, the same pattern you see in peanuts. Follows the same pattern. Is, is any of the CMI aggression for DMI fungicides? Yes. They don't work. They don't work on this one. 
We've had growers in Georgia last year made five applications of generic TEV, and it rolled over it. Didn't stop it. Now, we were able to slow it down in some trials where you're not going to do this with five applications a headline. $15 a shot. So, and that's not a sustainable program anyway. Uh, any, anyway, these are the symptoms, the leaves fall off. It's kind of hard to take a picture of cotton defoliating. I don't, you can do it with peanuts real easy, but, uh, uh, but anyway, as I said, we, we've seen 70, 80 percent defoliation with, with target spots. So the question is, that hasn't been answered is what's the effect on yield? The trials that we ran at Gulf Coast last year clearly showed that two to three hundred pounds of lint per acre was possible. Uh, the consultants in Georgia, you get down around Bainbridge, they're saying six hundred pounds of lint per acre on a susceptible variety. That had been confirmed. Factors that influence the amount of target spots you might see. The big one is variety. And I'll show you a slide to illustrate that. One of the things that I thought might be a big issue is crop rotation. However, we had trials down at the Gulf Coast substation where we put, there were cotton variety trials put out on land and a three year out cotton rotation. And we had cotton where we had cotton for three previous years. It all got blasted. Same amount of disease on the rotated land as there was on the non-rotated land. Have a rotation down at Headland where we have, it's mainly a peanut rotation trial, but it has a number of cotton rotations included in it. Didn't make any difference as the cotton frequency of how much target spot we had out there. It was the same across all rotations. I would think that it would be worse under reduced or stripped tillage. Simply, particularly cotton behind cotton because you got the trash out there where the fungus overwinters and it makes it much a quicker transition for it to jump up onto the lower leaves from previous year's cotton litter as compared with clean land or turned land. That hadn't been answered yet. We don't know about that. But the wetter it is, the faster it moves. I mentioned varieties. This is just data from the Gulf Coast substation. It's two different variety trials, the common varieties that were included in both trials. There were other varieties in these trials. Uh, let me put it this way, the scale runs from 1 to 10, 1 being there's nothing out there, 10 men means either they're 100% defoliated. A 7.5 is 80% leaf shed. And typically, not all the time, 499 is the one that has the most leaf spotting and defoliation. And the DPLs tend to have less, though occasionally you'll have a variety hop up there and get a little bit more defoliation like 1044. Now, one of the issues is at this point in time, we're not real sure about when we should be assessing disease in cotton. That's one item. And we, we don't really know how to associate defoliation with yield loss. So some questions, big questions need to be answered right now. But if you plant 499 and you got irrigated, you're irrigating, you better be ready. When, when did you take the assessments? When, when were they assessed? Mid-September. Okay, so this is September. Yeah, so the problem, what I'm not sure of is, see, is how should I rate them at 50% balls open, 75% or 25%? I don't know. So that's something that needs to be looked at this year. But be aware of, of you know, certain varieties have more of a problem than others. In the loss assessment study that I did last year, 
We'd have got a much better response to the fungicide inputs with 499 than we did with DPL 1050. Uh, so the more susceptible the variety, the more likely you are to see a response to a fungicide input, basically. Uh, scouting, you know, of course we really don't have a lot of experience with it, but as you're scouting for insects, look for leaf spots. It won't take that much longer as you're walking along. And again, you're looking for that ring spot, leaf spot on the lower leaves. You'll probably start seeing symptoms at first bloom, more than likely, if I had to just throw a dart at a board. Uh, I haven't seen any leaf spot on our cotton in South Alabama as of yet. I'm going to go down Thursday and start looking at the plots we have at, at Fairhope. So we'll see. Basically, you know, look at first bloom, look over the next three to five, six weeks, see what's going on. If, you, if the disease is coming on, then you could schedule an application of a fungicide. So, now the trials done down at Gulf Coast last year, we had two of them work. We got a significant yield response when we applied, and I'll show it in a minute, a fungicide at first bloom and then two weeks later. I had a second trial where I had an on-demand program. In other words, we scouted the cotton and sprayed when symptoms were first seen. Did not get a significant yield gain from any of the fungicides in that test. But again, that's just one year. So, if you see it coming on, go ahead and schedule a spray. And, but once the bowls start to open uh, and the leaf spot shows up at that point, it probably won't have any effect whatsoever on lint yield. So, the earlier it shows up, the more likely it is to be a problem, and the wetter the weather is, the more likely it is to be a problem. If you look at fungicides, as I said before, it's irrigated cotton, you treat it bloom, and then two weeks later. On a susceptible variety, that's probably not enough fungicide applications, but, that, but based on the labels that we have today, that's what we got. Uh, in dry land cotton in particular, start scouting at first bloom and then depending on how, on what the weather looks like, the forecast, what's the yield potential of the field, you might, want, might or might not, and the variety that's out there, you might or might not want to schedule uh, fungicide applications. We have three products labeled. Probably for the foreseeable future, these are the three products that are labeled. They all contain a stabilian fungicide component. As a result, we are limited to two applications of any of the products that are labeled. They have this nice wiggle room that says alternate with a fungicide with a different mode of action. There isn't one. So I don't, you know. It would be nice if we had a broad spectrum material like uh, chlorothalonil or manzate or mancozeb to throw in with these products. We don't. The fungus that causes target spot has a real history on vegetables where the spray prog programs are much more intensive of developing resistance. You go down on tomatoes in Florida and you put headline out it won't work anymore. Uh, there are some other chemistries that are coming down the line that probably have better activity against the target spot fungus than these products right now, but they don't have a cotton label. So we really are between a rock and a hard place as far as materials are concerned. The one test last year, this was preventive, where I saw a control and a yield gain out of uh, with a fungicide uh, was headline at nine fluid ounces, two applications, and got 
300 pounds of seed cotton from two applications. And that follows pretty closely with the results of the field trials that have been, have been conducted in southwest Georgia. You might get a yield response or a yield gain of up to 200 pounds of lint or 600 or maybe about 500 pounds of seed cotton. Reniform nematode was mentioned earlier. We have root knot issues in cotton. The only way to respond or to be able to tell what to do in 2014 is to take a nematode soil assay later this summer into the fall and into early winter. So basically, any field going into cotton next year that you don't know what the history of that field was, you don't know what the nematode status was, needs to be sampled. If it's had reniform in the past, it'll probably have reniform or root knot on down the road and you'll have to treat accordingly. And hopefully sooner or later we'll have some more resistant varieties to both one or both of these nematodes because we don't have any good nematicides right now. I mean, we're testing some in peanuts. I guess they'll come into cotton, but nothing matches the performance of Temic, at least from what I've seen. Uh, if you're scouting and you see some depressions in the field, that's pretty. That's one of the good symptoms or signs of symptoms of nematode damage, but it could be something else. So if you're, if you're troubleshooting, you take a soil sample, send it in for a nematode assay, but at the same time, take a soil sample for a fertility test to double check that it's not a pH problem or fertility problem. And the other thing you need to keep in mind are drainage issues, traffic patterns, hard pans, those sorts of things could also account for symptoms similar to those that you would associate uh, with a nematode. We have some fusarium wilt around. It's associated with root knot. The plants start to wilt and die late in the summer under a heavy fruit load. And we also have verticillium wilt gives you pretty much the same symptoms. And again, if there are any questions on diagnosis, send a sample to the uh, plant diagnostic lab down in Auburn. Uh, and we'll take care of it. Uh, quickly on corn diseases, in the last couple of weeks I've seen a lot of seen some northern corn leaf blight on a few corn varieties, particularly your pioneer corn varieties tend to have issues with northern corn leaf blight. And, uh, but it, it takes a lot of northern corn leaf blight damage to have your yields affected. Uh, some trials I had down in South Alabama indicated that at least 25 to 30 percent of that ear leaf has to be taken out uh, at the milk to dough stage for you to lose yield to northern corn leaf blight. If it spots up a few of the leaves, it ain't going to hurt anything. The other one is southern corn leaf blight has started to show up. It can do the same thing that northern corn leaf blight can. It'll blight the living daylights out of the corn. And if it gets it before the corn has hit the dense stage, takes out that ear leaf, you could lose some yield there. Uh, and it's probably going to be more of a problem on irrigated corn as well. And there's a lot more of that around. There's common rust out there. It's not a concern. And so far this year, I have not seen southern rust. And this is the one that could tear corn limb to limb. But I haven't seen any in South Alabama. We have not had the weather patterns necessary to bring it into Alabama. It's got to come in from Mexico. And we just haven't had the weather. If we had an early tropical storm, I'd worry about southern rust. Didn't have it. So I don't think we're going to see this disease this year. Any questions? I know you're real excited about peanuts up here. <laughs> of course, if the price went up, you probably would be. <laughs> <laughs>